Howdy everyone, my name is Griffin Furlong. I'm a professional in the state of Florida and in today's video, we will be learning how to read construction plans. This is all part of a construction plan series where we learn how to read a set of construction plans from start to finish. If you haven't already, feel free to check out some of my latest videos. I've walked through cover sheets, existing conditions, site plans, utility plans, I mean, you name it. But now we are on to cross sections. Cross sections are the essential building blocks to a site plan. Because if you don't know how wide things are, how do you know how to plan for it? Especially if you're building lots, roadway, and when you're backed up to particular constraints like wetlands, existing features, ponds, and your boundary. Without further ado, let's dive right into it. Now, typically on a construction plan sheet, you will always have your proposed road cross sections. With this project, it was a really, really big residential neighborhood. So we had multiple different cross sections for different roadway types. This county is very special where they have different pavement widths for certain types of roads. So let's kind of dive into what we may find. Let's go to these larger ones up here to the top. Now let's kind of break down what we are seeing here. So Typically with cross sections, they are always labeled with a specific label. So this happens to be section AA. This is 100 foot ROW. What is ROW? ROW is right of way. Right of way is an area of land that grants access to any sort of pedestrian use, road use. Now right of way can either be private or public. Public just means that it is owned by the government. So let's say if you're in Pasco County, Pasco County, if it's public right-of-way, the county is responsible for owning and maintaining that road. That is where all of your tax dollars go. Now, if it's private right-of-way, that means it's owned by some sort of entity, which typically in residential neighborhoods can be your HOA. So that's the reason why you pay a ridiculous amount of fees to the HOA. Now, a lot of times you will see the design speed and the posted speed. And I'll be so honest, I really love scaled cross sections. In this case, we had NTS, which means not to scale. So everything that you see here, there's no scale. So if you were to scale this 24 feet out, it doesn't really correspond to this two feet. Now, I don't really love that, but I, I see why some people do it so they can fit in more sections in the plan. But I like a good scale. Now, a thing about cross sections is that typically with roads and right of ways, there's a particular county or city standard that you have to follow. So this 100 foot right of way was pretty standard for this county. We had to provide this two lane road, 24 foot pavement, on both sides. Also a 12 foot mixed use path was also required for this project. So with these cross sections, it really helps you understand, you know, like what you can actually fit within this right of way. Now let's go down to maybe more of like a local type road. So this is what you might see, you know, in your cul-de-sac in your neighborhood. So we have a 50 foot right of way. We have 20 foot pavement with two 10 foot lanes. Looks like we got some green space in here between your curb and the sidewalk. Now, typically in cross sections, you're always labeling these features. You always want to label your sidewalk, your curb, and some people even label the road pavement section. So the pavement section is your section of asphalt, base, and subgrade. Road and right-of-way cross sections are pretty standard and straightforward. Now I'm gonna move on to some of the key cross sections that you might wanna put into your construction plans and ones that you might see. Now typically when I'm building a construction set, I get a high-level map over here and I just start understanding where we have major constraints. You always want a cross section on a major constraint. Now, what is a major constraint? Well, if I know that I have a wetland over here or maybe an existing pond or maybe a boundary, you know, you might want to start taking cross sections and understanding how you are actually going to grade your site and grade down to match existing. So for instance, so with this QQ, I definitely wanna know how that cross section looks for this wetland because we are trying to direct the contractor to perform a certain amount of work. So what does this cross section look like? Let's go to QQ. And before we actually go to QQ, what do we have? So we have lots adjacent to a wetland. Now, one thing I'll say about this is typically with residential neighborhoods, you need cross sections from lot to pond, lot to wetland, all of your roads, and then definitely any sort of buffers. So a lot of boundary areas, which we'll dive into a second, but you have a pretty set list of 
standard sections. So let's try to find QQ. It looks like I'm finding it up here. So what are we telling the contractor to do here? So here in QQ, we have the future residential track and the width might vary. And I know a lot of people might get confused about this is like, well, where exactly do I take the cross section? You know, do I take it here, there, there? You know, I, I feel like I can create a million cross sections, right? Well, we always just want to put it on the most conservative part. So we typically put the cross section right where the lot line might be closest to the wetland. So if the lot line was further away from the wetland, well, it won't be as big of a deal because we have room to grade. So in this case, we're giving a general direction for the contractor, right? Because we can't be perfect with the perfect amount of width. So in this case, we have a future rear track line. The width varies, but we're telling the contractor that they are able to grade four to one max and match existing grade at the silt fence line. So we're grading right at the wetland boundary for this project. Now, in some cases, counties and water management districts have certain buffers that you have to follow. And a lot of times we'll just grade right to the buffer. Sometimes we're allowed to grade a few feet into the buffer, but then you have to call out specific type of buffer impacts, wetland impacts, and so on. Let's go to another cross section. So we've kind of looked at what it's like, you know, to direct the contractor to grade from a wetland, from a lot to a wetland, but let's look at another one. So it looks like we have an interesting one here, KK. I definitely want to see the relationship between this pond and then this other pond as well as the road. So let's see how that looks. So here's a little bit longer cross section and I kind of just want to read this from left to right. Now, typically on cross sections, you'll definitely have to show a whole bunch of dimensions as you can already tell, but you'll also have to have clear cut labels. So with ponds, you typically will show the normal water level line. So this is where that wet, you know, that wet pond will be. Now, if you had a dry pond, obviously you wouldn't have that water line, but maybe the county or water management district that you're working in will have you labeled the design storm event. Also typical on cross sections are all these call outs of two to one max, four to one max. That's just telling you what your maximum grades are. So if you're grading four to one max, I can only grade 25% between these two zones right there. And two to one, I can only grade 50% right here. Again, it's all just rise over run. Also, we'll call out a lot of political lines. And I call this political because this is a 15 foot maintenance berm. So the people or the entity that's going to own this pond and maintain it and do all the mowings, you know, these are the legal limits of where that berm is located. Now let's keep going forward here. Oh, and a lot of times you'll have to call out specific elevations. A lot of counties like to see that because they're reviewing your stormwater report and they're just making sure that your top of bank meets the design high elevations and that this grading actually works. I'm gonna move our way over here. So now we have this 100 foot right of way section. So the relationship is from that pond. Let's get a grade, 77.35. Then we get all the way over here. So the top of bank of this pond is 77.5. So what actually is that difference, 77.5? Okay, we're only going up 0.2. So we're only going up you know, a, a few inches there. And then on this other, you know, area, we got a floodplain compensation pond. We label the normal water. Now, one I definitely want to show is more so of a boundary. Whenever I start a project, I always try to understand the cross section at our boundary. So, you know, this is a really good case. This red line is our property line. We cannot fill or do any sort of work outside of that red line. So let's go to section OO. When we're cutting cross sections, at the very start of a project, you know, before they actually look very pretty like this, we're typically just hand drawing them out. And what we're doing is we're understanding the existing grade elevation at that property line because we're held to it. So we're doing a lot of things at once. You know, we're trying to understand this existing grade. We're trying to give ourselves enough space to fit everything in while also fitting all of our lots, our roads and everything else. And actually, I, I kind of want to take a small step back from this cross section. I'll, I'll get back to this. You know, when we're site planning, this is really, really important because we have to know the right of way widths that are required for all of this road and, you know, the sidewalk that we're installing. And then we also have to know our depth of lots 
and our depth of lots are always based on whatever the home builder product is. So, you know, there's a particular product as we call it. And that's just the depth of the home and the potential accessory, maybe like a pool. So we have to understand all these things in order to understand if we can even fit this particular width within our boundary. So it's really just a game of trying to view it in a vertical form, but giving the horizontal distance that we need just to be sure that we have enough room to grade. And I'll show you what I'm talking about here. So early on, we were understanding the existing grade. And what we did was we gave ourselves 40 feet from that property line all the way to this track line there. That's because we definitely wanted to give us enough room to give us any potential buffers or drainage easements because we have, you know, some swales and some drainage pipe in the back that collects runoff. You know, we, we needed to make sure that we can actually fit all of this in here. And this is where we team up with the drainage engineer. And then we'll also team up with the landscape architect and the planner because we have to know if buffers are required for this project. Because let's say you get to the bottom of the ninth inning, you're trying to get construction plans approved, and the county comes back and says, hey guys, did you know that there is a required buffer of, let's just say, 40 feet? 40 feet here. Well, shoot, I, I just gave 40 feet, and I'm only calling out you know, this 15-foot adjacent use buffer and then this easement can I even have my easement in that buffer? And then that ends up being a really tough conversation uh, of, of overlap here. That's why I strongly suggest when you are first creating a site plan, you have to know these cross sections. Cross sections come first. You have to know your boundaries. You have to know how much room you need. I know for this project, we gave ourselves a ton of space just so we can fit the necessary items in. And it really takes collaboration. Honestly, guys, I think that's all I have. If you guys have any questions, feel free to comment below. I hope you guys learned something new. If you haven't hit that like and subscribe button, please smash those buttons, smash the subscribe button. I hope to build this engineering community and I hope to get to know all of you guys. I'm gonna be hosting more workshops, more webinars and giving back to this wonderful civil engineering community. Hope you guys have a good day and I will see you in the next video. Peace out.